Okay, so what we've been doing um, to the room, we, you know, we've been here every Wednesday, and we've been doing this, I think it's been since like November. Um, uh, every week we come and we will bring in a different supervisor or a different professionals, and we answer questions and pre present um, lots of information about the industry. And we've been growing. The club, I think, is, you know, over like 2,300 people now, which is really, really awesome. And I appreciate everyone who's ever recommended or suggested you know, somebody to come to the follow the club or nominated somebody for the club. We really appreciate that. So this is a good time with the growth that we've had to kind of stop and go back and do some of the Sync 101 things that we talked earlier on and some of our more recent rooms we've hesitated to go and address fully address some of the Sync 101 questions because we always wanted to move forward. And we created these res these resources on controlcamp.com um, that you can go to and, and get a lot of the basics. But this is a good time. We've all decided to to really uh, kind of go back and revisit this. So we're going to do it like an extended Q&A. We're going to take a lot more questions today. We're going to start the Q&A process earlier. We've got this great um, panel up here. And we're going to... Um, walk through and Steph is going to going to uh, start and lead the discussion just kind of walking through some of the initial framework that we created in some of our resources and so for if you if you're not familiar when I talk about these resources we have a, a website which is controlcamp.com control is spelled like control alt delete so c t r l camp.com on there, there's a sync 101 page and on that sync 101 page you can uh, get a lot of the information that we're talking about uh, today. You can download those PDFs for next to nothing in terms of cost. And you can also join our um, Patreon. If you choose to join our Patreon, what you get, especially if you're new, you get access to all of the rooms that we've recorded since we started recording. Uh, we, re we record our weekly sessions and we actually take notes um, of all of our sessions. We take notes of all the questions. So if you're listening to the recording, you can kind of go through the outline and find a particular question that you're interested in, and it'll tell you what time code in the recording. So you don't have to always listen to all two hours. You can just go right to the information that you need to, to know about. Um, and so that those replays are available to our Patreon subscribers. The outlines are available to our Patreon subscribers. And all of these resources that we're talking about are available are included in the Patreon subscription, or you can you know download them uh, individually. But we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, so you f the hand raising is up. Uh, we are going to start taking some questions. Before that, I'm gonna let S Steph do a um, kind of a, a, a run through. I'll just take it away, Steph. Okay, before oh, I do oh. that, I wanted to introduce Jennifer, or, or Jess, if you would like to introduce Jennifer, that gives me time to get my stuff together. <laughs> yeah, okay. I know, I was like, I'm gonna, let me do that quick. Um, everyone, this is Jennifer Smith. She is the head of Rat Dance Party Music, awesome music supervisor, board member of the Guild. This is her first room, and we've been telling her about it for a while, and she's finally on the app in here. So, Hi. go. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer. <laughs> Thanks, sorry I'm like late to the party, you know. Uh, thank you Jess and Jaden for like texting me every week and finally I made it. I'm um, like Jess said, I'm a music supervisor. My company is called Rat, R-A-T, Dance Party. I have two pet rats, I grew up having rats. We have dance parties every morning, hence the name where it came from. Uh, I do music supervision for film, TV and new media, including podcasts. Back to you, Steph. Let's get this started. That was rad. I love that. So I'm going to let Eric run through. But before we do, I'm going to start with probably the most important takeaway. And part of the reason why we did tonight is because I get asked, and I know that everyone on this panel and more other supervisors have been on here, get a lot of DMs asking a lot of follow-up questions and stuff. And we just thought it was really important to kind of go back and do stuff. But I think the most important thing that I'm learning not just from our room, but being in other rooms. Actually, Atik, who is a music supervisor over at the NFL, started a room called How Are You Doing? Which I thought was so silly at first. And then I started talking to him and I was like, wow, I get why you're doing this. Because what I've learned is, especially on Clubhouse, everybody asks of everybody. And we're all really excited, ourselves included, because we're all peers and we're all getting information from each other. You know, we all want to connect. So I think one of the big topics that I want to talk tonight is 
about reminding everybody, including ourselves, including me, including everyone on this panel and you guys too, is my favorite slogan. Come on, everybody. What is it? Be a human. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> really? <laughs> Only Eric? Thanks, guys. Be, <laughs> be a be human. Ah, Jennifer. Be uh, a that, human. That's, that's, that's what I say all <laughs> the time, it. Steph. That's hilarious that you're like, that's my motto. I'm like, I always say that in panels, like, be human, please. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to open that up to our moderators tonight to talk about you know, what it's like just to give our audience a little bit of perspective on, you know, what it's like to receive briefs and to be inundated with the work. And I always say that music supervision, especially, is the most um, underappreciated, overworked, underpaid job you can probably have in this business. It's one of the hardest and it's one of the coolest. So I just thought if anybody wanted to take on the panel tonight to give a little bit of perspective to our audience of what the other side is like, just so you can... Uh, understand why it's important to be a human. Jennifer, come on, you want to take this one? Well, I was going to let someone else speak because I could go on a whole tangent about being a human. <laughs> I guess I'll start. Uh, Jess, do you want to go first? You were like unmuting yourself. I saw you flashing. Oh, I was like, if you didn't want to talk, I would talk. I think we're all doing the same oh. thing. <laughs> go for Everyone's it. Everyone's so, You go. This is your moment. <laughs> Okay, this is my moment. I know I sound a little crazy, but it's totally fine. Um, be a human. So thank you, Steph, for saying that about music supervision. I love my job, but it is the, it is, music is the least most important thing in the world, <laughs> especially with production companies of all sizes. And, you know, I love my job. I love what I do, but we are like inundated all day. So we get, you know, just I'm watching my emails climb up as we talk and it's like hundreds of emails that fly in of like different music and everything. So it's just about being a human, you know, I'm one person. So my company is just myself. And on top of that, you know, between my projects that I have to focus on um, to, you know, having a life like work life balance is super important. And if I'm working a 16 hour day on a TV show, the last thing I want to do is just listen to unsolicited music or respond to emails like what you're working on. I'd like to spend time with my husband. I'd like to go on my spin bike. How about just like take a breath? So and, and I get that people, you know, everyone's in their own little bubble and they're like, my music's the most important thing. And I'm super excited and I'm excited for you. But there's a time and a place and just you can jump in to cut me off because I'm really tired. So sometimes I just ramble and it's just just you kind of have to think about that. Um, I always say don't take it personally if someone doesn't respond like, you know, I've I've used music that came in at the exact same time. Like if I'm working on a, that on a project and your music comes in and it's exactly the type of music I'm looking for at that time, you know, sometimes I'll click, you know, if it just kind of you know, the universe kind of lines it up, but I'm in the middle of one thing. I can't keep jumping around. So just be patient. Like we are not horrible people. We are humans. You are human. We want to respect the art and the time. I mean, you you're the worst. You're the worst though. Like <laughs> I'm the worst. <laughs> <laughs> like how am I the worst? That is funny. No, but it was a delay. It was delayed. It was supposed to be timed after you're like, I'm a good person. I'm like, no, actually, you're the worst. Oh, no. <laughs> well, that kind of I love you. Me. That kind of leads us to the fall, or our kind of second, um, you know, helpful hint for tonight, which is follow aggressively and DM cautiously. Um, so I would like to put it back to the panelists. Maybe somebody give Jennifer a break about how you do like to be um, engaged. What is the best way, especially if people are asking for you know, unsolicited material. And before I go, I want to say to Jennifer, one thing that I love that she said is, I don't think we've really talked about this, is really be patient. It's not personal. Sometimes it's like a workload thing. I have a super guilt thing when I read things in my DM and then you can see that little scene thing go up. Oh gosh, it's and the I worst. Don't <laughs> I, I, I do that too because you caught me like at the right moment and I saw it and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then my phone rings or emails pop in or a new cut comes in and I, you know, and I just, I just forget. But yeah, I, I it's, you know, it's the social media thing is like people are like you saw it, but you haven't responded. They must hate it. They didn't listen to it. They didn't like. E they didn't respond back. And like people go down this like vortex of this person hates me. And really, you're just like, oh, uh, my phone was ringing, and then you just got distracted and started going to your next thing. It's nothing personal. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in on the sync side too. Like as someone who's pitching to supervisors, as someone who has 
amazing relationships and, and some of these supervisors like you and Jess um, are my closest and absolute best friends. Like even I will send out an email and not get a response for a week sometimes. And I've learned like that never take that personally, that supervisor is drowning in work. Um, and like, you know, I just want like artists in the audience to hear that again, like don't take it personally. Someone who has close relationships with supervisors and works with them weekly still gets her emails delayed sometimes. And just, that's just the nature of like the job essentially. That is an awesome point, Jaden. Um, and I am reminded of, we had Kelsey Mitchell on, um, I want to say maybe like a month ago, um, we were interviewing her and she was talking about how, she, you know, she's she's the director of music for Ignition and I think she's been in that position since October. And since being in that position, she comes home from work every day and tries to go through a few emails from... Um, artists who sent her emails or, or people who sent her things to check out and doing that every day from October till when we interviewed her, she still has like 500 emails that she's been unable to get through. And so from an artist's perspective, I think a lot of us are just unaware of the workload of a music supervisor and una unaware. So when you're hitting someone up, you're like, you know, oh, they're on social media, they're able to hit me back or we just we're really, a lot of us are really clueless about, you know, how busy professionals are. And so one of the things we do try to stress in this room is, you know, we're bringing professionals here, but, you know, this, it's a, we're, one of the reasons why we're so thankful that you even take the time to come. And Steph, Jaden, uh, Jess, you guys come every single week and you got Jaden and Jess are up, you know, it's two, what, 2, 2 a.m. your time and you're here and you're going to be here for the next hour or two, like, which is just insane yep. the level of, that you commit that much uh to this community and so we we really appreciate that but i think it's we're so all of this is in the context for for the people in the room all of this, this is in the context of how do we even approach how do we how do we get a relationship how do we how, what's the what's the right way to engage with these professionals and so it you know understanding the humanity of the people that you're dealing with. And they're not just the gatekeepers. They're not just the people between you and your music career, but they're actual people who are on their own path, who are dealing with their own issues and struggles, um, allows us to change. If we, if we can change that perspective, then we change the conversation. We change the way that we engage. And if we can engage correctly, if we engage in, in a more effective way, you know, um, like you're dealing with a human being and not a gatekeeper, then you have more of a shot. And I found from my own personal experience, just how I engage in who I talk to and who I've, who I've been able to, to build relationships with, approaching people like people and talking to them like people and being considerate of their time and not being offended or upset when you know somebody doesn't respond to a dm right away and not following that dm up with a hey did you get my dm hey did you respond to me did you check out my music or or what have you um that it goes it goes a long way so uh, and by the way i like to remind i wanted to remind our room of this especially because i have to remind myself this our team is constantly talking about this it's really to make us feel better too to be reminded that you know if you reach out and you don't hear back it could be, have nothing to do with you, not only personally, musically or otherwise. I had a really interesting meeting with a major studio this week and they said, well, how can we, what can we do to help, you know, foster better communication between creators and, you know, our studio? And I said, feedback, <laughs> you know, if you can afford the time to do it. You know, unfortunately, what happens is a lot of supervisors and a lot of studios don't have the time for feedback because they are so buried. But whenever you can get it, it's nice. But it's also really good to remember they don't always have time to give it to us. They want to, but they don't. And unfortunately, and the reason I had brought it up to them is because you as a songwriter can feel and me as a songwriter feels this way, too. You know, you just kind of start to go down a rabbit hole of well, why didn't they like this song? But anyone on this stage can tell you that there's a number of reasons that have nothing to do with your music that can kill a song in a spot. A scene can get cut. As a matter of fact, that's a really good, I'm gonna, instead of talking, ask uh, Allison and Jennifer and Jaden and Jess who are placing music every day, what are some of the other reasons aside from a musical moment, you know, a music 
thing that songs get cut. I'll jump in with that um, because I dealt with this today. (laughs) So um, especially in TV and film, the the cut is constantly changing because you get notes from the network, the producers, you know, the director. There's like a whole process that goes in when you're creating uh, the string out, how the episode's being put together from footage. So sometimes the song will kind of be in there, right? And it looks great. It sounds great. And we have this great like, okay, we have the episode put together and it gets sent to the next network and the network says, I don't like this. You know, it seems a little, whatever their notes are. So we'll get it back and maybe the episode gets completely cut or we have to change the music or just the way there was a song in there, the way it was placed with the scene, it worked. And then again, the editor had to go in and do a cut because the showrunner is like, you know, I want a different tempo in this part and it just doesn't work. Things just don't flow properly. Or from ADR, the new cut that came in, the music doesn't work with what's going on. So something to keep in mind, especially for all of the songwriters, artists, and other people is, especially for sync, music uh, elevates the story. The picture and the story come first. The music adds to it. So you have to think of that, especially with music, right? Sometimes a song sounds great, but when you put it with the actual, the cut of the picture, it just doesn't work. You don't cut picture to music, you cut music to picture. So that's something to think about. You know, sometimes you hear a song and you're like, oh my gosh, this song's so great for the scene. And then I put it into Pro Tools just to kind of do like a rough cut to see if it works. And I'm like, actually, this doesn't work with the visuals and I'm back to square one. So that's just something to kind of think about. That is great. Uh, Go ahead, Jess. Uh, for me, something that comes up that makes a song not work, which which also happened recently, is, and I'm sorry in advance if this is a thing, but in branded content, um, on top of just the creative matching the picture, behind the scenes, what also has to happen is the song, and sometimes the artist itself, has to also match the brand, which in a case, we had a song with... Um, pitchfork and they love the song it was great all about it they they love especially when it's like an indie artist and you know there's more promotional options there but they looked up the artist and not that anything was wrong with the artist but the artist didn't match the pitchfork brand doesn't matter if sonically it sounded right the artist itself and the artist as their own brand didn't match the magazine so we couldn't license that song um and that's a whole extra level that comes into play uh, when you're working in, in my type of kind of content. That's amazing. And I think these are kind of, um, <laughs> I love Clubhouse loves the words. These are gems, but they are, they are, there, this is information. I don't think that we've really touched on that much. So I appreciate your insight on, uh, both of them. Allison, I know that we're losing you soon. Um, so, uh, on the flip side of that, I'd like to ask you, um, since you're kind of stuck in the middle <laughs> a little bit, where you're receiving, you know, kind of pitches from, you know, people like me or other artists or other music houses or different people on your publishing roster and sometimes even not. Um, and then you also have to pitch. So you have to kind of validate those songs and then um, communicate with other people. Do you have, you know, any tips or thoughts on how you like to approach your supervisors? How often you do do follow up any kind of insights before we lose you for tonight? Sure. Um, I don't, I don't follow up much. I kind of try to space follow ups. If I do, maybe I'll follow up at most a month later. If I don't get a response, maybe a few months later, I, you know, I think that if you're not hearing back, the chances are if somebody listened to it, they're just not interested. And it's so true what Jaden said. I mean, like, even as a professional, um, music supervisors only have so much time, even when you do have those relationships. That's really, that's really great. I think that's a really smart thing in terms of, uh, again, not taking things personally and knowing that, you know, if people want to reach out to you, generally speaking, they do. And, and again, not, sometimes it is something like, you know, uh, Jess had sent me something for Conde and 
Um, I didn't respond or she thought I didn't respond back. And then we figured out that my emails were getting spammed and she's like, Oh, you should have like followed up with me. And I was like, I'm not going to follow up with you. That's crazy. It was many things. She's like, yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> you know? That was so frustrating. And then we tested it and it kept happening. And I'm like, she's replying to my own email and it keeps sending it to spam. No idea why it's happening, but that's a, a reason why we don't answer sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but at no reason, but at no point did I actually ever think Jess was ignoring my email. And I really thought, well, she asked me to submit this. And if she didn't, she just didn't like the song or doesn't really matter, you know, <laughs> and we move on and she'll hit me again when she wants. And I think the more respectful you can be, I have found people will come back to you over and over again. Just because your song didn't work for one thing doesn't mean it's not going to work for another. And many times, I'm sure everybody on the stage would agree that supervisors will hold on to things. We've heard supervisors say this before and use it for something else, you know, in the future. Oh, a hundred percent. And I was going to say something really quick just to kind of give everyone perspective. I'm sure Alyssa could talk about this. Um, content's not quick to make. All right. So let, let's just think about that for a second. I have a show that, you know, is at the end of development that I've been working on for two years. By the time it shoots, that'll be another probably, I don't know, five months. And then we start post, which could be by the time it airs, that's almost five years after it first started. Films are years. So when people see on IMDb, oh, you're in pre-production, people think that means you're looking for music. That's not always true. It just depends on what the project is. When you're in production, like I've been on Why Women Kill... Allison, I don't even know how long I've been emailing about that since 2020, and we haven't even aired our first episode. So just kind of think about how long the process takes. And when it comes to music placement and everything, unless it's an on-camera, meaning someone's singing, dancing, karaoke, those type of things where the music is part of the picture, content takes a really long time to create and lock. You know, one song could be in I had a song I was so excited about in my film, Deadly Illusions, which is on Netflix um, March 18th. And maybe two weeks before we officially locked, we changed the picture and I had to replace the song and my heart was just so broken. But, you know, it goes in a different playlist and I will find a home for it one day. But just kind of think about that, that when I send a brief, like, you know, Allison and I work together all the time. I send a brief for something we're working on, but I don't lock picture maybe until two months later or the mix, it doesn't get mixed for two months. So don't think if you don't get a response back away, don't be like, hey, how did this work in the cut? Sometimes you don't know. One, the editing's not done. And two, things move around. And because we're in the COVID world, things change all the time. It takes so much longer to shoot anything. Oh my gosh, it's just... It's an extra layer of, of slowness and things change. So just kind of think about that. Sometimes, you know, for me, I try to be proactive on collecting types of music and everything for my different projects. But that doesn't, I mean, I could be sitting on music for eight months before we actually start going through it because I create playlists and really collaborate with my showrunners and my directors on films where we are trying to create a sonic thing before we even have the lock script or we started shooting. So just kind of research the process of creation when it comes to content. And that will also help you communicate better with supervisors. I think one thing you hit on that's so important when communicating with you, if you're going to be just reaching out on a whim to music supervisors, do, of course, do the research and find out what projects they're working on. And also include key adjectives about your music in the subject line that might catch their interest. So if Jen is working on Why Women Kill and I don't know, you have some sassy female vocals that you think might work for that show. Put that in the subject line because she'll be more likely to click it if she needs it right away. All oh, such such good um, such good feedback. And just from a creative perspective, well, let me do two things because I also want to I get pull Koichi into this conversation to ask from a creator perspective how he approaches relationships. But while we're doing this, if anyone in the audience has a specific question about um, about building relationships, we're going to move from this into um, the main steps for how to get a placement. But just right now, we're going to, op- we're going to raise, um, open up hand raising for those who may have questions about approaching supervisors specifically. Um, and again, how, the way we do this, if you come up, you have uh, one question. We don't do follow-ups. We'll ask your question, and then we'll put you back in the audience so that we can keep it flowing and get a we'll – get, we'll get like three or four questions just depending on how long the answers take. 
and then we're going to move on to the the next flow. So, um, and then while you're pulling people up, I'm also going to introduce the amazing Amy Roland, who's the VP of Sync and New Business at Sony Music Publishing. She has an expertise in Latin music. Yes, I am reading her bio because her title is so huge that I didn't want to mess it up. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Thanks for joining us. Uh oh, Amy. Hi, 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 Steph. I'm sorry. I'm still having issues with the mute button here. Uh, thank you for for inviting me. It's it's been great to listen in, and I'm happy to be here. Amy's new to Clubhouse, and I keep kind of dragging her in too. And we appreciate <laughs> that. In. Always good to see you, Amy. Thank you. I have to log off, but it was great to hang out with you guys. Thanks for having me and Steph and everybody. Allison, thanks for th thanks for coming in. We really appreciate Bye, it. Bye, Ellie. Thanks, Bye. Allison. Bye. Bye. Come, come back anytime. All right, so we got uh, Steve-O. You got a question about um, reaching out to music supervisors or building relationships? Yeah, I do, actually. Uh, what's up, everybody? Um, my question is more so like how not to be annoying so I guess it's kind of centered around like, let's say you send a record or even a greeting and you don't get a response and you take it as, okay, maybe this person's busy or maybe they, uh, you know, didn't like the record that you sent, which is cool. Do you not send another follow-up message if you don't hear back or like, how do you engage them a second time if it's been, you know, a couple of weeks or months? You know what I mean? Can I direct that towards Alyssa? Because she is the queen of follow-ups in terms of being polite and <laughs> the right things to say. And just so you know, the only reason why I'm, a, I'm polite is because I run all of those type of emails through Alyssa first. <laughs> yes, we are a great team in that sense. Um, personally, what I would say is you have to think about the approach and what you say and how you phrase your words when you're reaching out via email first of all and i'll just type an email first because that's usually where i get a lot of requests um a lot of times my subjects will come in and it's it'll say something like i know you can do this for me and then the body of the email <laughs> like explains what they want but 10, I would say nine out of 10 times, the requests that I get are always, I know you can do this for me. I want this out of you. How can Quincy, blah, 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 blah. You know, so if you can pivot your approach so that it's not necessarily you asking for something, but you bring value, that's going to help get you, I would say, past that first round. And then second of all, I would wait, honestly, a couple of weeks if you don't hear back, if you have a valid request and you and your heart will know if it's valid. And if you can wait a couple of weeks, you know, send another follow up, that would be fine. And again, I can only really speak for, for how I operate and appreciate those types of requests. Um, so that that would be fine. But if you don't hear back on the second time, I would just say try a different person <laughs> because if they haven't responded like we kind of talked about earlier, there may be a reason why. And again, I wouldn't take this personally, but sometimes um, a lot of the sync houses that people reach out to are run by two people. And this is just kind of how it is across the board. It's a very small team. Um, even the larger corporations that have, you know, a lot of manpower or woman power behind it, as you would say, still operate with a lower bandwidth. So sometimes it's just simply that they cannot respond because sometimes I'll get a hundred emails a day from random people. And if I respond to one a day, you know, that's still 99 adding up throughout the week and I just can't even read all of them. So sometimes it just gets lost in the mix. And um, yeah, you can definitely just try different people. There are so many people in this world <laughs> dealing with the same type of uh, field and I think it just you just have to keep knocking on different doors um I wanted to piggyback off of how she started this with the the outreach of I like to call it transactional communication so Alyssa's saying like reaching out and um you know not making it like what can I get from you but here's what I can give to you like here's what I can provide how I can help um I find that that is the, probably one of the number one reasons I don't respond or it makes me have a negative reaction is because it's a, the outreach is transactional and basically like, hey, Jess, like, this is what I want from you or what can you do? What, what can I get from like talking to you? 
Um, and that makes me go, uh. so like, this is definitely like amazing advice. And, and also like, if you get to like the third or fourth round of trying to follow up, like at that stage um, that Alyssa's talking about, where maybe try another person, I do want to point out that maybe another person is talking to somebody like Amy or, or Jaden and finding that middle, middle man who has these relationships and will not get ignored because we know them. Um, and that's something that I could, to like check in with yourself and see if it makes sense to have somebody manage those relationships on your behalf uh, so that you can just focus on the music and not have to um, chase all of us because we're, as we're all saying, it's very hard to get in touch with us in the first place. So it's like an extra foot in the door for you on your behalf. Such good feedback. And we've heard that um, in different ways uh, throughout our rooms that, you know, the, there is definitely an advantage to working with a music library or a sync agent or some middle um, uh, middle agent uh, that can some type of represent representative who already has the relationship. Because as we're seeing, establishing a new relationship, you know, it's not impossible, but it's very, very, very hard. Um, and so uh, we keep hearing that message over and over. Before we get to um, uh, Israel and then Mosin, um, Koichi, I want to get your take in on this because you just, what, where's your thought in terms of how you approach relationships? Because you, you have clients, you, you work, um, with people you place music with, but you also have relationships with like manufacturing companies. And so you, you did something to put these in place. So you, you must have some type of, um, process to sure. establishing and, and managing these relationships. So talk I mean, about that. Yeah, for sure. Like, so for me, you know, I mean, I, I can answer that very easily. And the, the, the short answer is time. Like I put in time. So I, you know, if I send out emails to people I don't know, I don't expect a response. I don't know you. You know what I mean? You don't know me. So, um, if I can reference a third party, you know, someone who I know is in your good graces or that I've done work for, or, something along those lines, then for sure. Like I, you know, I, I want a solicited introduction, not a, you know, a, a cold call. And I know that's not always going to be the case. Um, to, to Steve was you know, kind of piggyback off of Steve's point earlier. I appreciated that he actually said, Oh, like, or just a, a greeting, you know, now I, I think that's a good idea, but, I, and I do this a lot too, but if I'm greeting people, I'm, I'm not going to actually try to do that via email. Cause it's, I already know how, how many emails y'all have to sift through and, and deal with. And a lot of times people do have social accounts and things like that. And I'm going to see what your life is like via the social media lens. And if, you know, hopefully I'm a fan of what you're working on. And, um, and there's some kind of common interest where I can start to be supportive of what you're doing. Like, I don't, I, I, I prefer to work with people who I actually want to, I mean, that's going to sound weird to say people that I actually want to support. I mean, there's not like people I don't want to support per se, but if I'm working with you, I hope that you like me too, you know, and, and I took this a lot from like, I used to be a, a product rep for, for Yamaha a long time ago. And I would have to go to different stores and, you know, like it, that's a grind, you know, and getting, getting a, a salesperson to like, how do I make them sell my stuff? And people would be like, Oh, like your numbers are really good. I, like, how, how are you doing that? And I'm like, Oh, I'm making make sure the salesperson likes me. You know, because if they like me, then they're going to want to, like, try to help me out, even if I'm not physically there. But they're like, oh, he was cool. Like, he didn't go out, of, you know, out of his way to to hit me up all the time and this and that. I'll just check in time in a timely manner, in a respectful manner to Steph's point. Like, I try I try to be a human. But, I mean, like, a, a month ago, oh, I, I, you know, I was talking to a songwriter who I'm starting to do a little bit of work with now and. Um, that took like a, a year of just reaching out and, and being supportive and just trying to trying to be a friend on the internet. I know that's a weird concept these days, you know, but it's it's like a thing. Um, and at one point, yeah, she was just like, "Hey, like I know you've always been really supportive. Like, do you, like I, I don't think I've actually heard your music though. Like, do you want to send something over?" And I was like, "That like for sure, I'll, I'll send something over." You know, and again, not with any expectation, but like, cool. Like that was an invite extended my way. Of course, like, you know, do the timely thing, be professional and respond as quickly as you can when those opportunities arise. But a lot of these things just take time. And I, I, I'd like to, if ideally, be friends with the people first and then, you know, um, 
and then reach out with whatever, whatever, I mean, to, to the points earlier, whatever value I can provide. And sometimes that's not even my own work. I might be like, Hey, I know you were looking for X. I have the right person for that or the right project. Like, can I help put that in touch for you? Like, can I put these things into play for you? Cool. Like, and once again, I, I like to reiterate this a lot, kind of with zero expectation of any kind of reciprocation. I'm like, you know, someone's going to help me along the way. It's happened plenty of times. I, I try to remember and give back when I can too. And, um, you know, re relationships take time to build. So um, it's, you know, if I see someone hit me up, and I, like anybody on this stage can identify a copied and pasted email in a second, you know? So, oh man, those are the worst. And the, the best, the funniest is when I, I try, those ironically, those are the ones I respond to because I go, Oh, um, I'm sorry, I'm not James. <laughs> oh god. Because <laughs> they copy funny. and paste the hello James or hello yeah. Rosa or hello anybody who's not you. Here's my personalized email to you. And and all joking aside. And I shouldn't be a dick about it because listen, we all, we all do it too. What we, and we probably do it in a different way, you know, within our company, Alyssa and I have a spreadsheet. And if we reach out to people, number one, because I like Alyssa to, again, ch check my spelling and my grammatical things, especially two, because I'm really blunt and short and direct. I can seem like an asshole when I'm not being <laughs> one. I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to say asshole in clubhouse. I think, um, you know, so I, I like to check for those things. But three, you know, because we don't have time to recreate a pitch. And if it works, why would you change it? So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But what I would do is put it outside of Instagram, put it outside of your email and just make yourself like a note or something someplace else. A Google, We love Google Docs in our company and we love Google Sheets. Put it in Excel or Google Sheets or whatever. And then, you know, really take that thing and make sure that you you know, the things that work you have in the body of your email and then personalize it. Take the time to personalize it every time, even if it's a sentence, you know, like you can even just bullet point out the little things that you want to hit in your mark. So you have them to remember every time when you're pitching, but, you know, take the time to personalize them. Yes, Alyssa, I know that we're losing you soon and I don't want to keep you here if you're, I'm, I'm cognizant of Alyssa's time because she's doing 8 million things. I'm managing my manager. <laughs> Thank you. All good. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I ahead, just Jennifer. wanted to say something real quick about when you're pitching to supervisors. Um, I, this is, I'm not the only one, Jess will, I'm sure will applaud with this, is please get your business buttoned up. Don't send me, you know, SoundCloud, Spotify. I can't do anything with that. As I said before, I work with picture. And if I can't download anything, and you need metadata in your MP3s, do not attach MP3s. Have a non-downloadable streaming or non-downloadable or non-expiring downloadable link. Hello. Oh, Jennifer, you know, I'm going to pause you because we're going to get into this. And oh, I okay. Then you pause me. You pause wait, me. Sorry. I'm a, I'm a, no, no, no. Don't apologize. I'm going to pause you because everything you're saying is what we're about to get into, and I'm going to make you explain it all the oh, way through. Oh, okay. Well, then I will do my <laughs> business buttoned up talk coming soon. All right. Wait. Just one minute. I'm going to let Eric um, reset our room for a second just because we're getting to the kind of 6 o'clock hour, or at least, you know, getting to that time where we should reset. Um, well, so let I'll me let before, Eric reset, and then we're going to jump into that. But we have we have two more. We have I'm sorry, three more three questions. questions so we're going to do those. To we're going to do those. Yeah, we'll do those quick. And for since it's getting close to the nine o'clock, I want to get to three questions in nine minutes. So that's three minutes of questions. So one quick question, and we'll get one or two soups to answer that, and then we'll move on to the next one. We'll start with uh, Israel. Hey, how's it going? Uh, thanks for having the space, and thanks for answering the question, you guys. I just followed everyone that's on the stage. Um, so my question is, I'm, I am a composer, and so I'm used to uh, establishing relationships with music libraries and things of that nature. Um, now I've transitioned from being just a composer to being the owner of a music library. And so my question is, I'm starting to find that maybe music libraries do tend to work with, um, I mean, maybe music supervisors do tend to work with libraries that they've already established relationships with and do the same um, do the same rules apply when reaching out to music supervisors as a muse as a brand new music library that would apply if I you know just trying to establish a relationship directly as a as a composer or as an as an artist so 
Good question. Uh, yeah, thank that's you. a great question. Right. Anybody, one or two people to take, tackle that? Yeah, it's all, it's all the same thing. It's all relationship building. It doesn't matter what the gig is or what company you're working for. Um, at the end of the day, like I'm going to respond more to somebody who's treating me like a real person behind an email. And, um, and when it comes to what, like what libraries we work with or why, like I, for me, what I do is, um, regardless of my relationship with people, I have to dive deep into their terms and conditions and look at their long form and see if we can actually use their music based on our media needs. Uh, because a lot of production music specifically or, or these websites like Musicbed, um, Artlist.io, uh, um, a lot of, not Musicbed because they have a different sync team, but the ones that are more automated, um, for my type of media use, I can't agree to their terms and they don't have anyone who can negotiate with me to make a, um, a long foreign template that works for my needs, for my company. Um, and so even though their music catalog is great, I can't work with them because I can't license their music and we there's no middle ground um, to stand on. And so that, that would be a reason why I wouldn't work with a production music company that is like well, well um, known in the industry is because of needs like that that a lot of people don't realize because it's not creative at all. It's all legal stuff. The, the stuff no one wants to talk about. <laughs> That is great. Uh, great insight, Jess. Um, Mosin, you have a question about uh, relation, business relationships? Yes. First of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody uh, for taking your time and dealing with this clubhouse madness. Um, my question is, uh, when trying to reach out to certain supervisors who are uh, represented by someone, uh, are, are there any best practices uh, when you're dealing with that person in, in between. Um, a lot of times I go on IMDB and, and you know, I'm researching supervisors and obviously there's no direct uh, emails or anything like that. So um, I'm still trying to figure that out as to, you know, what the best practices are uh, when reaching through their representatives. That's my question. You're saying so best practices for reaching through a not to a music supervisor, but if the music supervisor has uh, some type of rep or agency or somebody repping them, a management? Correct, correct. Uh, um, okay, so we want to, I think it's still like another human being, so probably this is the same type of thing, but what, what does the room say? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on that. So the information you're seeing on IMDB is about um, representation. So, you know, depending on how they set up their IMDB, either... They want their agent or manager to be contacted by, you know, someone that wants to hire them on a project. So what you're doing, you know, that isn't really the right person that you would need to talk to. I will say this for a lot of the music supervisors, you know, one day I'll be able to have a coordinator, you know, on some projects I do and some I don't. Um, is your a coordinator or an assistant is honestly your best friend. Uh, they're the one, they're kind of the gatekeepers to the bigger music supervisors. Um, people don't realize that. So if you see like insert music supervisor and you go on their company website and they, you see other names at the company, try reaching out to them because a lot of times, you know, it's the coordinators that take all the music and digest it and put it into the system. And so they're the ones that kind of are a little bit more hands-on with the music, you know, and they're the ones that could be like, hey... Jess, I think this would look, you know, be really great for that spot you're working on. And Jess would be like, oh, great. Thank you. Is it vetted? Yes, it's vetted. And there's that. So really, you just kind of have to do your homework about who are these companies? Where are those? But those reps you see on IMDb are your agents that that's what like the studios or production companies contact to negotiate to bring you onto a project. So they're not really the right person you should be talking to anyway. That is, I think that's the first time we've had that advice about the music coordinator and that is in fact i see maya who's maya is in the audience she's taking our notes so i'm going to ask maya if you can like highlight that um so when we put that in the notes because that's just an awesome gem i really love that that's one of the most valuable pieces of information i think we've given out in this <laughs> room um and, and Jaden and i were talking about this as well music coordinators uh, i think we don't i think it's worth mentioning that title because i don't think we really talked about this jennifer big bang on your first day come on <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, awesome and 
you know, Alyssa, before we lose you, I'd love to hear your perspective too about, you know, the importance of uh, contacting the right person versus trying to go direct to artist or direct to music supervisor or direct to the person that you're trying to get to when this person on any side of things does have representation. Yes. So I would say your risk is going to be burning your bridge because if you reach out to the person directly and in their mind, they've kind of made it up. Okay. This person is someone who I don't really want to deal with. I'm just going to ignore. And then if you reach out to their assistant, secondly, the assistant will bring it up, but then they'll just say, Oh yeah, I've already looked and I don't want to be bothered with this. So if you are going to reach out, you know, try to reach, as Steph and I like to say, the low-hanging fruit, (laughs) try to reach someone in that area. And then when they review it personally, they can, you know, put their own spin on it for their boss or whoever they are talking to and then give them that perspective because really you only have one chance with one person. So I would just say be careful and, and research who these people are because sometimes there's very clear instructions online where they say, do not contact me or do not reach out. And if you do that, then you've kind of burned your bridge. So just do your research on that front. And then, um, like I mentioned, you know, just take it one day at a time. (laughs) Um, I'm just going to say thank you, Alyssa. That was like perfect. The low hanging fruit. I am going to say this, and I've had this happen probably in the last two years, is where someone will send me music and it doesn't work for my project. And then they try to track down my director and send their music. That's extremely disrespectful. And at that time, they... Yeah. Yeah. And that musician burned a bridge with me because they did not respect me and they respect my relationship with that director. So really, you know, think about how how the cause and effect works on those things. So really just, you know, do your research, respect the process. You know, I know you're just so excited to meet people, but just, you know, respect people. You don't want to burn a bridge. You don't want to do something that, you know, could hurt your career or hurt your legitimacy in this industry because everyone talks and everyone knows everyone. Beautifully said, Jennifer. I got to jump right now, but thank you so much, everyone, for having me and Eric and Steph. As always, thank you. Always a pleasure, Alyssa. Thank you, Alyssa. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, Alyssa. Bye, everyone. So I'm going to have Eric reset the room because it's just six o'clock. Wait, one quick. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry, McKinney. Yep, McKinney. Let's get McKinney in real quick. Get a quick (laughs) answer for him. I didn't see McKinney. Sorry. And then I will do the reset. What's up, McKinney? Question about music business relationships, right? Yeah, um, if I'm being honest, Jennifer kind of answered my question. Um, yeah, um, by a happy accident, um, there uh, a unique story of mine. Um, I was working at a film festival. I was volunteering at a film festival one time. And just for me volunteering at the film festival, I actually ended up becoming like really chummy with this lady who in retrospect um, was assistant to one of the music directors. And then it ended up building this great relationship. And then that just by dumb luck was a lesson that I learned before Jennifer spoke at all. Um, but in addition to her comment, um, like that was that's just something I kind of gleaned from it was just in a, a quick reminder was just like yeah like you don't always have to have um like go straight for uh you know the big cheese you know what I mean like like there are other people involved in those circles that are actually um barriers themselves for all the bs that they don't want to get to the people who are actually the the, the key holders if you will but um yeah, I say that to say uh, Jennifer answered my question, so I'm good. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Appreciate you coming up, though. Thanks so much, man. No, One no last problem. thing to touch on that we haven't really talked about in this room that we should, based on this que- uh, you know, kind of question, is be careful to look when people say, please do not send us unsolicited music. Don't send them music anyway, because it's super stressful. You know, there's legalities around receiving music. Um, you know, even when you have relationships with people, and I'm sorry to do this, Eric, but just since we have Amy in the room, because Amy and I were in another room and we were listening to people give some bad advice about, you know, sending unsolicited music uh, to publishers and to other people. Amy, or if you're with us, would you mind talking about that a little and, you know, how you can receive music when you're not supposed to be allowed to? <laughs> sure. Thanks. Thanks for asking, Steph. Um, so I think everything that's been said is key and that applies across 
you know, whatever sector we work in, be it music supervision, publishing labels, um, be respectful of people, be respectful of the follow up process. So from a major publishing perspective, we do not accept unsolicited material. So one of the worst things you can do as a new writer or artist trying to reach us is kind of send a blast out to 20 people at Sony ATV at once with the same email and hope to get kind of um, ears on that song. Likely you're just gonna go to spam folders. You might get an email saying, we don't accept unsolicited material. So if you don't understand the process, the way you would start as a new songwriter, we would always recommend you go through one of the PROs or through another respected industry professional, be it a manager, a lawyer, a label, that can recommend you to a publisher to listen. And then in turn, obviously, if um, there's a deal in place, then we would pitch that music to the music supervisors and down the chain. Thanks, Amy. That's really great advice. And you know, um, it's not always a lawyer or a manager or a sync rep or somebody else that does that. Maybe let's sync rep with publishers and things like that. But you know, I, I bring this up because not everybody in this room can afford a lawyer right now or has, is, you know, is managing their own things and is not at that, you know, stage of their career yet, or maybe you're self-representing. You can also make inroads through good friends. You know, I came to know Amy through my songwriting partner, Morgan, who I, is going to jump in the room in a second, but, you know, and Jizzle and other people. I have great relationships with Sony because of my friends. So it's not always, and even though I have an amazing manager, you know, I didn't meet, you know, the publishing company we work with because of that, you know, you can get validated by other um, colleagues. So I would, you know, kind of re-encourage something that we, you know, we're going to probably say a thousand times in this room, which is um, work with other people, collaborate as much as you can, because collaboration not only makes you a better stronger writer for better or worse if you have a bad session with someone you're going to learn something if you have a good session then you get a great song there's kind of nothing bad that can come out of it <laughs> you know you're going to learn either way or and hopefully come out with a great song but you also start to open yourself up to all of their resources and these days we all need everybody's resources and that game is played at the top <laughs> so you know don't think that all of the large songwriters are not playing that game and collaborating. They might be negotiating at a much higher tactic, but that's the game. So collaboration is, you know, key and a great way to get introduced to those people kind of naturally. And now you're it's absolutely right, Steph. <laughs> Thank that's, you. That's a hundred percent right. You can. And that's where I think, you know, respected people in the industry that are respected and it's through friendships, other colleagues, and also the PROs, you don't have to have, a big budget to go register your songs with one of the performing rights societies and ask your rep there to recommend you. So if you don't know somebody to collaborate with. That's Ooh, another that's option. another one. Maya, if you don't mind taking that note, that's a great idea. You know, you're, you have a, a PRO that you're signed to. If you're a songwriter, they have reps. They can also introduce you to people and they also have film and TV sync departments, they want you to sync your songs. So if you're making some ways and you're making great music, they're going to want to help you. Uh, you know, so that's a really great resource that we've never talked about as well. Thanks, Amy. There's so much in that point that I really do want to stress because we don't have a collaboration is another thing that we haven't talked about enough in collaboration as a means of building relationships. If I think of all the libraries, the businesses that I work with, at least half of them came because I collaborated with somebody who was already in relationship with that library, agency, organization, brand, whatever. And so for if I take note of that in the room, like, cause what we've been hearing that for the whole first hour has been, oh, it's that, you know, getting in touch with the supervisor is really hard. You know, the email boxes are full. Uh, they, um, you know, they might not get to your email. They might not see the email, give them time, you know, build that relationship slowly over time, like Koichi said. Um, but if you want to be, if you're like, oh, you know, I really would like to get in Warner Chapel's catalog or Sony's catalog, or I want to get at Marmoset, or I want to get at some of these other agencies, all of these people, all of these companies list their artists on their website. And a lot of those artists are, 
are a lot easier to reach than the A and R um, at those companies. And a lot of a lot of things, even like on Song Trader, Song Trader lists all of the licenses that come through Song Trader, and they list the, age, the artists that get those licenses. So it's a lot easier to reach out to some of them is if you hear somebody that's, if you're a pop electro art, electro pop artist and you hear somebody just, you know, on your Instagram is just celebrating because they got a really dope electro pop placement or song traders giving them on blast or they're on somebody's website as, you know, you heard this song in the, in the real, then it's a lot easier to do some of the same strategies in terms of reaching out, still reaching out as a human being, but you're reaching out a little more laterally than vertically and you'll get a lot more success that way. Awesome. And now it's time for a reset, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for a reset. All right. So if you've been in here, this is Control Camp. Uh, we are a community of uh, musicians, songwriters, independent artists, etc., all coming together to learn about sync licensing. That is getting music synced with television programs, video games, advertisements, um, and anything that associates music with picture. And so uh, I'm Eric Campbell. I'm uh, one of the founders of Control Camp. Daraj, who's the other founder, is uh, not able to be here today, or he may jump one a little later. Um, but we created uh, this space. Uh, we're both uh, very experienced in sync licensing. I have my music in lots of TV shows. I work with uh, companies, both TV production companies and music houses, creating music for um, uh, various media. And I've been doing um, sync licensing for a while. And Daraj uh, has an extraordinary resume, including the um, most recent placement on the Super Bowl. That's probably not the most recent, but that's the one that we talked about in here. Um, and so we created this place to kind of bring uh, a community together. We pull together every Wednesday supervisors and other composers and people who there's so many different walks uh, and paths available within the sync space that we want to get all the ideas and the gems uh, here in a place where, where we can all learn collectively and level up uh, together. So we're here every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we stay after this uh, at 10 p.m. We do a, an after party, which is a less moderated space. It's a much more free flowing. We just it's four members of our camp control camp. So if you um, you see the in, if you're looking at the room control camp is right above the title of the Sync 101 room, or you can click on my profile and at the very bottom, it's the first club in that profile. And if you follow Control Camp, then you'll be invited to the after party. It'll show up in your rooms when you log, when you leave this room. Um, we also do a listening party, a listening room on Saturdays where you can bring your music and you can submit on our website. And then we uh, take uh, some of those songs on Saturday and uh, listen to them and give them feedback as relates to um, how your song uh, relates or how your song works in sync. And so um, that's on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so Wednesdays, Wednesdays and Saturdays are our three rooms that we have right now. And today we have uh, uh, Steph Fink from Music Box and I, we've been uh, hosting this conversation, kind of a Sync 101 reset. We've been doing this room since uh, at least November, and we've covered a lot of ground. And so we wanted to double back for those who have been newer to our club and um, go through some of, the, some of the key messages of how to get started in Sync. And so for the first hour, we talked about one of our, excuse me, one of our earlier conversations, which is how do you even engage supervisors? Everyone wants to, you know, get placements. Everyone wants to kind of strike out and get a relationship, but a lot of us don't know. So that's what we were talking about for the first hour. If you're in and you missed it, don't worry about it. We, we record all of our rooms and we make those recordings available to our Patreon subscribers, which you can find on our website, controlcamp.com. Um, and you can, if you 
if, whether you're a Patreon subscriber or not, you can also go to controlcamp.com and get the quick summary. We have a we have resources there, kind of a Sync 101 resource. And one of them is called Seven Rules on How to Engage Music Supervisors. A nice, I think it's about a 13-page document, which just kind of covers the high points of how to approach music supervisors. And we've just covered a lot of this, treating people like human beings, following them aggressively on social media, but DMing them cautiously, finding out what they need, keeping your interactions brief, paying for access to conferences and uh, masterclasses if necessary, following up reasonably, and bottom line, it's all about the music, so making sure that the music is in order. But you can get all more info on all of those on our website. So all of these, all of these resources that we're covering are on Control Camp, which is C-T-R-L, controlcamp.com. And that'll uh, catch you up with where we are. So what we're going to do for this next hour, we're going to um, shift into one of our other topics that we introduced early on, which is what everyone wants to know is how do I get, what's my, how do I create a plan to get placements in TV and film? And so we have this process, four steps to getting placements and the high level steps. But if you, if this is part of your thinking and you walk in this path, then it leads you uh, on a path of actually landing your music, uh, in some place that's set up for it. So, um, Steph, you want to, uh, start with this? Yeah, let's get into it. So now I'm going to run through the four, which are one create syncable music. What a, what a shock, <laughs> you know, we're being a little captain obvious on that one, but it's something we're going to get into. Uh, two, validating your song so you understand that you have syncable music because making great music or making artistic music, making very musical music does not mean it is syncable music. Three, how to pitch your songs. And then four, creating that process and doing it all over again. So let's talk about creating syncable music. And since we have um, Amy in the room and... and you know, Amy, if you don't mind, I want to toss this to you first, because um, you're the great validator of music, working in publishing, especially, you know, how do we know what is syncable music? You Can you talk about some of the kind of, uh, I don't want to say rules, but let me just put it out to you. How do you know what makes a song syncable and what doesn't? I feel like, Steph, you maybe should be asking the music supervisors, not me, since they would make that final decision. Um, but I think I'm going to ask them, too. But, <laughs> but you know what? The reason I ask you, Amy, is because we work together in that capacity. We use, you know, what yeah. I find is publishers, you know, as the gatekeepers to the supervisor sometimes, too, will say, hey, have you considered that you're – I learned this from a, from a publisher. You know, your lyrics up front are a little negative. You might yes. consider – redoing that. So are there any kind of insights that way that you work with your songwriters to, you know, make songs more syncable? And then I'll put it to the supervisors, a follow up. Is Amy right? <laughs> Before you even answer. Great. I get to take a test. Um, no. So yeah, one of the things we definitely tell as we talk to the writers, we encourage that lyrics should generally be clean. Um, if you're looking for commercials specifically, a lot of times, if, if you're gonna write a love song, if it's neutral enough that it can, can work in different scenarios, that tends to work um, quite well. So, you know, like if a love song can be a Mother's Day, it can fit a Mother's Day spot as well as, as a Valentine's Day spot, I think it's kind of gonna be in a good place to have more life as far as that goes. Um, another thing that we get a lot of recurring is, you can have this song that has a lyric that has either a very happy feeling and then a sad melodic feeling and those kind of fights or the other way around those kind of fights between how the song sounds and the lyric what it's saying a lot of times don't sync as well as if the lyric and the whole melody and arrangement of the song kind of give that same portray the same message now i think there's also exceptions to to the rules so that's not um, necessarily 100% in, when, we're, when we're looking at Latin songs. Uh, I know one of the things, Steph, that we work together, one of the things that we've told our writers is Spanglish is a great option. You know, if you, if you can write the song in English, if you can write the song in Spanish, and then you can also do a Spanglish version, you're just going to increase the chances of being able to land that somewhere or have it work different ways within I love that. the project. 
Yeah, that's taught me so much. And I thank you, Amy. You know, before I validate you by having all the music supervisors chime in, I do. I should have given the caveat to this room that I will always say, even though we're throwing a bunch of quote unquote rules at you, it really starts with a great song. <laughs> and, you know, that sounds really cheesy and really a little trite, but I promise you, you know, I think it's best creatively not to overthink when you're trying to create for sync. And I think in the sync space, it's a mistake a lot of people make. They try to follow all of the rules. The rules are meant as guidelines and guardrails. It's like focus on creating a great song and then you can use those rules to adjust tiny little things that you might not have thought about is the way I love to approach things with our team. But I wanna put it out to Jennifer and Jess and Jaden, uh, especially ladies, thoughts? What makes a good syncable song for you? across any genre? Um, when I talk about our job, I describe it as painting pictures with music. And realistically, like you, you're, you're creating this whole visual experience and the final piece of the puzzle is music. Um, honestly, a lot of the times it's too late and too final at the end of the project. <laughs> I wish it was earlier. Uh, but it's really a song that just like, you look at this image, you look at this visual and it makes it complete and that you have a reaction to it um, or you don't have a reaction to it. And that's the whole point. It's supposed to make it this whole unique experience where nothing stands out. It just completes this visual that we've created with a sound. Um, and so like, that's like, as like generic of an answer I can give you without being specific to scenes and genres and lyrics and vocals and not vocals and we're, like mixes, uh, but ultimately it's just a thinkable song is something that completes the picture in front of you. So, uh, oh, go ahead, Jane. No, I can jump in on this too. Um, Cause I was just going to say, you know, like things I'm looking for when I'm signing artists and, and their music is like, what's the production quality? Like first and foremost, if you throw your song into like a spot of a top 40 Spotify playlist and you play through it, when you hit your song, does your ear like settle on it the same way it settles on like a fully produced track? Because the production needs to be that level um, of quality. And then like in terms of like other like syncable song stuff, you know, like dynamics in a song are really important. Like I, I literally teach a class on this at a music college um, where I work with my students on like the dynamics of a song, you know, like what new instruments are being introduced throughout the song? Where's the song going? Does it have you know, does it, does it build? Does it have a moment where it really pulls back and can work well under dialogue? If you take the vocal, this is my one thing, like if you take the vocal off of the song, is the instrumental so strong that it's like catchy and works well on its own? Because half the songs that I sync, they end up taking out all of the vocal or almost all of the vocal. And it's the instrumental that has to like sit there um, and, and do the work. So these are these are all things that like I'm looking for when I'm signing an artist at, like not even so much genre these days as much as just like does that song itself take you somewhere and like tell the story and help support the picture it's being synced to. I love that. Can I jump in real quick? I actually want to ask this follow up to um Jennifer um because it's in the same 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 type of question but from a songwriter perspective if you've been a songwriter for a while or this, that's your thing, most 90% of what we write about is love and relationships. What does that, would you, what would, advice, Jennifer, would you give a songwriter or anybody, but you know, I'm going to direct to Jennifer first, you know, in terms of how they may need to shift um, to be m more applicable to sync? So that's actually a really good one. Um, so Jaden and Jess gave like really great answers that it, you know, helps move the story. Like I said before, the visual, the story, um, especially for a full song, when you have a full vocal up, it's helping to say what is not being said. So if it's like a montage, you have a scene that's going on and the song add to the emotion and gives it depth. So for when you're writing for sync, of course, I mean, if you're writing a song, one, you want it to be a good song. And two, as Jaden said, you definitely want it to be uh, broadcast ready. Do not send a demo. I'll just hit delete. That's just ridiculous. Um, is 
just make it authentic and don't make it too specific because love is such an interesting, you know, topic because you can have love between family members, you can have love between friends, you can have love between lovers. And, you know, there's such a spectrum. There's like angry love, sad love, happy love, you know, a, a memory like a flashback scene to like your first boyfriend when you're 16. That is a type of love flashback. So I think it's just, you know, and also like Jaden said, if you took away the vocals and it's just the instrumental, it still needs to go because when you're writing music for sync, you know, again, radio to picture completely different, there's dialogue, there's room to breathe. You don't want it to be stacked up with like lyric, 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 and there's no room to breathe because we have to edit. Like I said earlier, we um, edit music. We don't edit music to picture, we edit picture to music. Oh, wait. You know what I mean? We edit the music to the picture. Um, we don't like edit the picture to the music. So the music elevates the picture. So just think about that too. Where is the space to breathe? What are you trying to say? Um, one thing about production I've noticed a lot, um, especially with MIDI production, is it, it's, one, you can always tell when it's MIDI. And two, it doesn't always mesh well with picture. So just be aware with a lot of modern production, you think it sounds cool, but sometimes it's too noisy. So like really, you know, when you pull your vocals off, listen to your instrumental, how does it sound? Is it busy? Is it too loud? Like really kind of look at what you're doing on a production level. Jaden knows exactly what I'm talking about, <laughs> about busy production. Some songwriters put on stuff because they think it's cool because that's what they hear is on the radio. Um, a lot of the songs don't really get used in sync. Am I answering your question? It's kind of late. So. No, totally. Yes, that's a great, a great answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And be authentic to yourself. Like, if you're writing a song, what is what is that story? What is that song? Like, don't, you know, if you're like, I, if you're writing a song, like Eric and I, you know, went to Arizona on July 12th. Like, that is a very specific lyric <laughs> that is going to be hard to place, and that's your chorus. So, um, and you know, I don't you can know what have, rhymes with 12th, so I would have a hard yeah, time with Yeah, you that. know, um, you know, verses can be, have a little bit of specific things, like I went to Arizona, they, you know, it's try to, they can have that, but, because chorus is used most of the time for editing, so you want to make sure your chorus is the one that is not, so Eric and I went to Arizona on June 10th. So just kind of think about that stuff when you're writing your songs. If you're writing a song and you're just like, I'm going to write a song and I'm going to put it out and it's my artist project, do you. Don't like try to, you know, think what, you know, try to figure out what people are going to do. Just do you. But if you're writing a song that you want to give possibilities for other, you know, media outlets like Sync, um, just just think about that for a second. Jennifer's full of the gems. <laughs> Amazing. So gems. Can I... Can I'll... I go to Arizona with you guys on June 10th? <laughs> I was going to say, how did I not get this trip to Arizona invitation? I was just making up an example. <laughs> I mean, now I just want to... Now I, it's I, a I, thing. As you can tell, I'm a very successful songwriter. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to go to Arizona. Well, listen, you sold the idea. I kind of want to go to Arizona now. So on that note, I, I think you and Jaden especially brought up something really great, which is our next point, which is how to validate your songs. And Jaden said, you know, one of the things you can do, especially with, with your mix, is you can listen to it against other mixes. And if you are writing to brief and you do get something that says, hey, you know, make it sound like this, you know, and you never want to copy those things, you want to use them for inspiration. But I love that for mix and mastering, but especially your mix. Listen to that song and say, does this, you know, hit the same way? Does it sound the same way? A lot of times if a music supervisor likes something, I know when I'm placing something, it's because, you know, it, it we might be liking it because it fits under dialogue, you know, and we don't like, like Jennifer was saying, you don't want things so noisy sometimes. So, you know, really try to listen to people. If a, if a music supervisor is nice enough to give you a brief, pay attention to it, you know, and validate against that. But um, I want to put it back to the group here. What else do you do um, to kind of validate your songs being ready? For, or what, what can people do to validate those songs being ready? Can we direct that to, to the composers first, like Koichi and Gil? Yeah. Let's see what they do, sure. where they get their yeah, I mean, from. I've got a, 
I'll, let me piggyback off of one thing actually that Jaden said because I've personally, you know, gotten this critique before, and sometimes I'll forget. So from a, from the production side of things, whether it's something that I'm writing purely as a composer or even with a vocalist, um, uh, there, like, I mean, everyone can look this up. There's dialogue frequencies. Make sure your stuff is not fighting that, like, because if it is, then you know, even if the editor is going to do some EQing, that's just going to break your track. So. Uh, it, it has to hold outside of that, like that sweet spot of the dialogue. Cause again, I think everyone has uh, said this also that, you know, you are the final piece of the project. The rest of the project is not going to be moved for you. So um, make sure that you can, you know, from a, from a mixed perspective, that's actually something that you can pinpoint a little bit to be like, Oh shoot. Like I've, I've got too much going on in this mid range. So let me dial that back and just make sure it'll, it'll fit. But um in terms of, I mean, so I feel like two easy things. Uh, I have a, you know, a Spotify <laughs> uh, playlist that I just do for myself. I'm like, if I see cool stuff in TV shows or whatever, I'm flinging that song into there and I'm going to listen to that in the car at some point. And I mean, you should be studying this stuff, figure out what's been working for people. Don't copy it, you know, but you can also, I'm going to slightly like uh, contradict myself a little bit, but I mean, this happens in records too, like the stuff that works. I will throw something into us. I will throw a whole song into a set, like a session and just be like, all right, let me study up the waveform. How is this building? Like, what's the intro like? Drops here, drops here. Okay, like, oh, they do like a big slow transition. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I mean, there's a, a lot more to it just than like, oh, cool. They're talking about this subject from this perspective. Very important, you know, the lyrics and, and song and top line. I mean, a good song is a good song for sure, but in this day and age, I feel like there is a lot of, you know, production tools that everybody has access to. And you really should kind of be going in there and digging, you know, past each layer, however best you can. And, and if, the, if that's not your forte, you know, hit up a producer friend and be like, hey, what about this, you know, to you, do you, do you hear that's like doing its thing that, 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 that makes it kind of special. And then, um, you know, take that advice, jot it down and, and try to apply, it, you know, and you might have to apply it a bunch of times before you kind of get to being able to, I don't even want to use the word master it, but like being like, okay, cool. I see what that is. And I, I know how to utilize that in, in, in my music, my way, you know, hopefully give it a little bit of a spin for yourself. But yeah, um, that would be my point. Um, I'm going to say something quick about production. So especially with a lot of the modern production stuff, um, this is just for like film and TV. You know, I'm not a songwriter. I don't. I'm also going to say this. Music supervisors do not represent your catalog and pitch for opportunities. Anyone that emails me and says, hey, will you represent my catalog? I, I delete because you don't know what I do, which is, again, disrespectful. Um, for production, a lot of cool stuff with modern production, it sounds cool, but there's something you need to think about. Um, if something sounds like a gun or a cocking of a gun, I can't use your music because that's not considered clean. I have to go by network uh, guidelines. I have to go by, you know, uh, SMP guidelines that I have had to pull music because the artist was like, oh, there's no gun sound. I'm like, that sound effect sounds like the cocking of a gun. I have to replace your track. So just think about these things a little bit more. There's a lot of like sounds. They sound really cool, especially, you know, they sound cool. Like the song sounds cool. But for me with picture, it, it just, it sounds like something different, even though that's not your intention. That's something to think about. What does the sound also sound like? Could it be misconstrued? So that's something, if you want to, if you have like a really, really cool dope track that has that kind of sound effect, go for it, but also create a track that has that removed. So that way you would double your opportunity to pitch. It is One hundo. I mean, from a trailer perspective, that is, at least as far as I've always been told, they're like, that's the editor's job. Like, don't touch that. So I'm like, cool, all the cool rickety extra stuff like i'll strip that bag if i know something's going out for that type of work because i'm just like i need to give them the most possible flexibility so that my track will stay to to, to jen's point you know so yeah and if, um on my end as well i think it it everyone already pretty much touched exactly i mean it's for me it's studying it's definitely studying um what you're pitching for uh the briefs pretty much have everything what they're looking for and um each one of you all has covered it so well. I mean, it's well, just Gilfo, basically just Gilfo, hey, hey, before you, let me, this is, this is Eric. <laughs> hey, quick question. No, because 
<laughs> one perspective that hasn't been covered is, and you might not need to do this as much now in your stage of your career, but maybe when you were starting, once the song is finished, did you have any type of inner circle or community or anything that you, any other way that you validated that, yo, I know this is ready and I know it, it holds up to bar? Ears, you mean, right? Animals don't, they can't tell me, but I think that's all I go by, man. Sometimes it's literally just me and my my cats, man. I know it sounds crazy. I used to want to, but at first I was like, you know, actually, I'll take that back. I did. I did have a couple of people that if it was something that was, you know, pretty, if it was I would pitch for like a demo or whatnot, I would send it just to kind of get ears on. And it's people that you really trust, you know, that that it's not like you're not, not necessarily sending them video or anything like that, but kind of just giving them, OK, look, this is what I'm on. Almost you want to sign an NDA with these people, man, because <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I, how can I tell them without telling them what I'm working on directly? Um I mean, just, just, it's just basically, I just kind of give them a rough look. It's just cartoon or whatnot. And I just needed to, you know, have this elements. Does it, does it feel like it fits that? And they're like, yeah, you know, I can see that then perfect. If they can see it without even seeing it, then that's a good indication that, that I'm on the right track. But otherwise I think it's just a and being directly from, you know, with the references or whatever, not just sonically trying to match all your, you know, it's the kick and the, when you listen to the elements, is a kick, is your kick matching where the that kick is, or the snare matching where that's or the strings are they as loud or as quiet as I mean it's those tedious things that is all we have. Sometimes we don't have a lot of information to work off, only you know a direction, and from there we kind of just have to do the best we can and just feel comfortable. But you also have to understand that you know there's a lot of I used to be that at the beginning. You don't, you know, a lot of us don't learn. We don't have teachers and, you know, we just have guidelines and you don't really have someone telling you, okay, stop. You're adding too much. You're overproducing at this point. Stop what you're doing, mix it, get it good, reference it and just send it out. Be done with it. That was one of my big things is holding on to tracks. Like, man, if that's the case, like everything I release, I'm probably like 20% happy with, to be honest, you know, it's just, but I've just disciplined myself to, okay, this is the best it's going to be at this timeline. I think I've met all the points. I'm going to go ahead and let it go and then start. Like, just let it go. But it's, you're always learning. You know, it's never, you're never, quote, make it. Like, there's no finish line. Once you get to a, a milestone, you realize right ahead, it's a whole different area. Like, the jobs are bigger. The qualities, you know, everything just ups. So you're never really at a, comf you shouldn't be at a comfortable place. So, yep, just keep learning, listening, learning. That's awesome, Guffle. I appreciate that. We need that. a for that. <laughs> yep. Thanks, and I Steph. Oh, man. Oh, man. The oh, man. did not <laughs> show me that you were even on the stage, so I'm so sorry. You were, oh, no, it's cool. I grabbed him as, as soon know, as he stepped on. You're hidden from view, but oh, can we can we? Thank you. I mean, it's always an honor. I love you. Can we just repeat what you said really quick? I just want to kind of sum this up between Koichi, Gildy, and Jennifer that... Uh, we, ha again, haven't really talked about, but if you're in this room, you're already kind of doing step one, which we're all you know in this room for is do your homework. <laughs> There's so much homework to be done. There's so much you can oh, learn yeah. to put yourself in the best position to be syncable, to be sellable. And, uh, you know, Koichi was blowing my mind today. I did not know that you can go study the frequency. I mean, duh, of course you can because the internet, you know? <laughs> Koichi is not allowed people. to be the quiet person in the room anymore because yeah, he on, always Koichi. sits back in the corner like he has nothing to say and then it's like, ooh, Jim. Ooh, another Jim. Oh, another Jim. I, I promise you that we will um, hit Koichi up for those um, you know, resources for the room and we'll get them on control camp. And then Guilty touched on something we've never talked about, which is a fault of mine that I had to learn and I still have to. And Eric knows because he works at me at a certain point, you got to put stuff down. And that doesn't mean don't aim for it to be amazing. But when you are working, I mean, Eric and I were working on something that was due, I don't, you know, nine hours from when we got it. And they knew the ask was crazy, but we were doing it. And at some point you just have to put it down and go, you know, because you could beat a song forever. You could be like, well, you know, maybe the end this, maybe that, and maybe this noise here and all those things. So at a certain point you have to go, okay, you don't want to be the enemy of your own greatness, but you do have to learn when is it good enough to stop? And I think the number one rule, which Gildy, you know, said was look at your brief. Are you hitting all the points? Use your brief as a checklist. 
Did I do what they ask? And then use what Jennifer and Koiji said, if you have the time to validate it further and say, okay, what can I do to kind of take this over the edge to say, you know, this is the song that they might use because you might get two great songs or three great songs for something. Maybe that little bit of homework you did, you know, that extra step made it one step closer for you to get. This is so cool. So yeah. th this was um, two out of four of the steps. But what I want to do is because we've got like 20 minutes left, 25 minutes. I'm going to I want to open up the floor for questions and this any sync one on one question you have. This could be about um, what we've already talked about in the first half, which was doing business relationships. What we're talking about now, how to how to um, make your music uh, syncable, how to get it uh, placed, how to how to. We didn't what we did not go into. Hold on, let me open up hand raising. What we, what we didn't go into was fully the different pitch methods, which is submitting to music libraries versus submitting through a sync agent versus doing business development. We've talked about this a little bit. We've talked about how really having a representative in some is in a lot of ways is gets you a lot more um, access because we've been hearing over and over and over that it's just really hard to. It's really hard to establish these relationships. And Koichi said the key thing earlier. It's really hard to establish these relationships quickly. And many of us in the room, we want our sync placements now. We have music. We want a music place now. And so agencies, libraries, these places that already have established relationships are probably a faster path to placements sooner um, the way I approach this is I am open to all of those types of relationships. I have music in libraries now and I'm, I'm open to those type of relationships, but I take my time and I build relationships with supervisors over time so that I, there will become a time where I, I won't necessarily, I'll be able to do everything directly. I may be doing everything directly or, you know, or, or with select partners, but relationships, I treat that separately from I don't look at relationships that I'm building as this is how I'm going to eat tomorrow. The relationships I'm building today is how I'm going to eat next year or the year after that or the year after that. If I need to eat this year, then I need to go to somebody else who's already put in the work to have those relationships this year. And that may cost me half of my publishing. That may, may cost me a uh, half of my sync fees, but that's the cost of getting to eat this year while I work on the seeds that are going to get me eating next year or the year after that. So I wanted to rush through that just as, as a concept while we open up the floor for um, questions. And we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll take questions. One question per person. We'll, we'll take the question and we'll put you back. And the audience will try to get as many as we can have between now and um, 10 o'clock. So don't, no long intros. We can look at your profile to, to know kind of who you are. Just go right to um, your question and a um, and then once you ask the question, we're going to put you back in the audience while we ask it. But if we need to do follow it, we'll pull you, we'll pull you up. Um, and I promise for women's month, I'm going to put Jennifer on the spot that I'm going to pull Jennifer in to do an entire room on the business of sync, because <laughs> it's so critical. Jennifer, we've talked about it in the room before, and it's worth repeating a million times because part of what, you know, you can't, and, and I'm going to, and I'm going to leave it at the whole room in it, whole room in it. But but being able being to able to think, think Hold on, make sure you, you can't, can't do it without, do it without your mute when you're, when you're on the stage. On stage. Sorry, go ahead, Steph. Oh, I was double. Oh, that's why I was doubled up. So anyway, you can't get your song. Your song could be the best song ever. But if you don't have your business buttoned up and I know that this was also an impetus for this room because I get a lot of DMs saying, can I license my own music? Do I need a sync rep? Do I need a publisher? Do I need a manager? Do I need a lawyer? How do we do that? When is my music copyrighted? I'm getting all sorts of incredible questions from this room in our DMs. And I try to answer as much as I am, but I'm going to have, I'm going to make Jennifer, if she'll indulge me on another. I will, I will hundred percent indulge you on a separate thing. I mean, it's all about education and that's why we're here. So I am a hundred percent in. That is awesome. All right, who's up first, Eric? All right, um, McKinney, were you back? Did you pull back? Or you just had a different question. Also, Eric, your seeds you metaphor earlier really was beautiful. By the way, sorry, I just had to say that. That was, that was oh, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, McKinney, you had another question. Hey. Yeah, um, earlier I heard someone say, um, "Do not 
um, submit unsolicited music. And when you say unsolicited music, whoever it was that made that statement, did they mean like music that doesn't have representation behind it? Uh, so unsolicited just means music that wasn't asked for. Um, like that's like, there, there's like more official ways to say it, but I think that's really what it means. It's, it's a unsolicited, I'm being sold music I didn't ask to be sold. Um, so when we solicit stuff, if you ever hear us saying, I want to solicit something, it, that's usually in reference of, I'm going to send a brief, I'm asking you to pitch me, send me your music. Um, the wanted, asked for versus not wanted, not asked for, unsolicited. Yeah, and if you want to get by that, um, another way to do it is to ask before you send. So what I, I said it earlier, because I'm saying, don't just attach a bunch of music or send MP3s or, you know, sh shuck music into everybody's inbox. Ask that person first, may I send you music? Because they might say to you, please don't, we're not allowed to receive it. Especially if you're like Amy and I wanted to send Amy something and I worked with Amy the other day and Amy's like, I so I wanted someone in control camp. I wanted to send their music. She's like, I can't hear this because they're not, you know, like whatever it was. So just ask the parameters. And she said, oh, but if you send it to me on Spotify, I can listen to it. So all I'm saying is mm -hmm. ask for the parameters first and then say, you know, may I send you music? And if they say yes, then listen. And then follow up, listen to how they ask for music. So if they say, please put it to box or please don't send, you know, SoundCloud or please only send whatever it is really try to pay attention to those things. Oh, adding to this, for everyone who has already DM'd me tonight, um, Jaden and I created a joint Spotify, uh, what is it, collaborative playlist, uh, where you can drop one song in, one song per person to check out. And if I, if the quality is good and I'm interested, I will stalk the shit out of you, sorry my language, um, and I'll reach out and figure out more information and, and test you to see if your business is tied up and like take the conversation there. So if you're messaging me on Instagram, the link is on my bio on Instagram. I don't think it's clickable on Clubhouse, but it exists somewhere on Spotify if you find my name. I do listen, we listen and we, we talk to each other about it over in Scotland, um, would love to hear it. Um, so I will accept it there and she'll accept it there. And we're both, I'm, li I'm looking to license and she's looking to pitch. So that's awesome. There you go. And I'm gonna tell you right now because Jess said that do like do not follow up with Jess. <laughs> like cause, cause in, in in sorry, Jess, I don't want that to sound uh like I'm, I'm no, like, you're right, you're take, right. Go. Taking shots at you. So because she just established that in this room, trust her that she is going to do exactly what she just said. That is what any of us on the stage are are doing if we send stuff out. You know, and I know that they will reach out. Someone will reach out to me if the need is there. You know, uh, if it's based on a time thing, sure, I might follow up and be like, hey, y'all told me this. Like, but otherwise, like the trust is now in her hands and respect that. That's that's all. That is great. All right. Let's keep this moving. Uh, and for, for the next couple of questions, I got three more in the queue. So one to two people per question. And then let's keep it moving, please. All right. Um, I don't know. I don't want to mispronounce your name. So you tell me what your name is uh, with the blue hair. Shuki. Shuki, thank you. for. How are you? Hi, everyone. I'm good. Um, first of all, thanks for creating this room. It's so informative. Um, I've come a bit late. So my question is, so you said something about obviously not sending unsolicited music, but is that just to to like individuals like yourself or to libraries? Like how does that work exactly? So every, um, depending on who you're pitching music to, every people will have different policies, right? So if you're looking at libraries, a lot of libraries, almost every library these days have their submission policies on the website and it'll say, we do accept music uh, at this time or it'll say we don't accept any unsolicited music at this time, meaning, meaning that you have to know somebody or be invited um, in the company to submit music, but many of these companies will list their policy and a lot of them will say something like send a streaming link with three songs or send three MP3s, that, you know, send exactly what they say um, and send it to this email address or post it to, you know, send us a disco link. And so for agencies, libraries, if you want to submit, submit music, 
once you first step is doing research to know who you want to hit up and then depending on who that organization or person is if it's an organization they probably have processes in in place and if it's a um person then that goes back to what we were talking about earlier which is really taking more time to build a relationship um, with that person so that you're able to communicate with them and able to know whether they like music, whether they want to receive music in any way and how they receive music. That's a longer, it takes a longer process and it's not a straight path, but the organizations, most of them have a process in place. Um, Chloe, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well. Thank you. Hope you guys are doing well as well. Thank you for having me up here. Um, I was just wondering, so I had previously had a discussion with Jess about, you know, released and unreleased music and then having it registered and the importance of having it registered with your PRO just so that, you know, your business is taken care of. My question is, when it comes to actual clearance and music licensing, um, what, um, you know, databases or what do you guys use to actually clear the music. So do you go through what's registered with PROs? Do you use Spotify or what's that process look like for you guys as um, supervisors and those that clear music? All of the above. Um, so I'll reach out to the PROs. I'll use them as like a database to see who represents them and then reach out to like the Amy's of the world and say, hey, it's confirming that you rep this song, what's your share? and put the pieces together until I find 100% of the copyright. Um, so if I can't find it, then I go deep onto the internet and I stalk people. I ask a bunch of my friends, like Jenny and I constantly talk shop because I'm like, have you, do you know this person? Have you cleared this song before? And like, we do that a lot. And that's also another way to get the information. Um, same with record labels. I'll just go down the rabbit hole and, and often reach out directly to the managers or the artists <coughs> themselves if I can. Um, to get the missing pieces if it's not a straightforward clearance. Uh, but it's a lot of like stalking people. <laughs> really. I would say I always done. have your contact information. Like, you know, you have your artist, you know, Instagram page. Put your contact information there. Like, make sure we can find you because we move so quick. I can't wait you know, uh, 24 hours. So just make sure you're easily found. Your contact information's out there when you register with the PROs. It's the correct email, not your ex-boyfriend's not email, not some email you never check. Just make sure your information on how you want to be found and contacted is available out there. Great answers. Um, Kristen, I got you next. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for this room. Hi, Eric and Steph. Um, I just wanted to ask about branding because I'm really working on my business side of, of being an artist as well. And something that Jess said was really interesting about, you know, they couldn't, you couldn't place this, um, this song because the artist wasn't branded correctly with the image of the magazine. So how important is branding and the look of an artist when, um, when you do go back to kind of check these things, is it important to have a brand? I think it's just, this is a good question for you too, but I can speak for myself to say, we recently dropped an artist who wanted to put um, a song we had done for a production. When we, when we do songs for studios, sometimes they'll go into our library if they don't go. And we had another placement for it. And actually the artist was like, I want to put this out as a single, but I went on to his, Instagram page and he was using the n-word and I was like no <laughs> I'm sorry bro <laughs> like, you can't do that you know you shouldn't do it at any time especially now you know better and the artist kind of got into a fight with us about it and we just dropped him you know it's as simple as that as much as he's a talented guy and has been on the radio before this is not a small artist I just personally was not okay with you know being in the space that we're in connecting us with someone who was behaving like that on you know, whether they thought it was innocuous or not, wasn't enough for us. So I think everybody's litmus test is different. Everybody's brand guidelines are different. Um, I think it's more about behavior than anything else to know that. And then of course, if you can, you know, have a strong brand, if you're an artist, to me, it doesn't matter if you have 3000 followers or you have 3 million followers. If you look like you have your stuff together as an artist, that's just always a nice thing because... You know, if there's a chance that someone wants to make a campaign out of something you do, 
it looks like you have your stuff together and they know it's easier to do if you are kind of willy nilly and don't have a brand together that way. But I wouldn't overthink it. That's my advice. Just behave. <laughs> I, I agree. The, for, for my work, it's very specific because I work in branded content. Um, and everything I'm doing is to support the brand, my brand's identity. Uh, so everything needs to be in line in that sense. I think in the more general sync space, um, branding isn't as important. Um, I will say though, like there are artists who have varieties of projects and different styles and different sounds. And so my publicist brain wants to tell you that you should brand it so that when I think of you in that project, I know exactly the look, the vibe, the feel, just to like differentiate the different artistry that you're doing and creating. Um, but I agree with Steph, like it's more, it's more about representing yourself appropriately in, in today's day and age. Like no one wants to work with an asshole to be straightforward, you know? Um, so like in, in the example I gave, it wasn't even about somebody misrepresenting themselves on the internet. It was just like, they looked them up and branding wise, it's not an artist that matched the magazine. Um, and especially when one of my magazines is Pitchfork, a music magazine, they're going to go deep into the artist because anything we do with music um, feeds into our street cred and credentials as music reviewers and curators for the magazine. Uh, so it's like this deeper seated uh, reasoning, but ultimately it shouldn't matter. Um, streaming numbers, followers shouldn't matter. If anything, that's one of the best things about the sync space is that you don't have to be famous to get this huge featured spot or this advertisement because it's more about the music and it's the song being good and it working to picture. I'm going to tag in on that too and just say like as I've synced artists who have literally no presence online, it's just a song or a, se or a series of songs, I've synced them for projects um, because I work across all media. Um, typically that's more in the TV space. And then I've also synced artists where it was some sort of campaign and they needed an artist of stature and they wanted me to send over the one sheet and all of their stats and anything cool that I could like dig up about them. So it's, it really, sync really operates on a spectrum, but I find that more often than not, it really does come down to the song and is a song quality and does it work? Um, but yeah, there's a little bit of everything for everyone, regardless of where you are in your career as long as the music is quality and really good. <laughs> Eric, I have to break the rule just to tell you guys this very quick anecdote to say in terms of brands, Billie Eilish, before she was famous, like literally right before she broke, she was already really popular, but not really be before she broke, broke, was wearing Air Jordans all the time. And I brought her to Jordan brand because her brand was very Jordan. She was literally wearing Jordans in every other picture and creating these whole outfits and looks. And she was young at the time. And Jordan was like, really? This girl? Seriously? And I know this is recorded and I'm going to get so much shit for this. But by the way, she's now obviously Billie Eilish and a huge ambassador for Jordan. But at that time, even though she kind of had this cohesive brand that, and, and somebody was begging the brand to do it, didn't go through that way. So to kind of Jaden's point, it's really about having those songs out in the universe and them being right. That's and have great. your business together. <laughs> like, at the end of the day, <laughs> trust together, me, yeah. everybody on here, I'm assuming on the supervisor stage would much rather have a, you know, maybe the not the best branded artist that has all their business like legit ready to go versus someone who's glitzy and amazing and, you know, checks off all the social boxes, but sucks. <laughs> so true. Amen. No Amen to that. All right, um, let's go into let's get Shelly up in here. What's up, Shelly? Hi, thanks so much, you guys. This is great. Um, I have a question about so I'm a kind of one stop shop, but I'm new to this, so I'm not represented by anyone. Would it hurt me to go through somebody else um, to be represented um while i'm while i am so far like self-contained like will it make more steps for you should i stay independent or does that matter um i can jump in you can i mean if i understand the question correctly you can stay independent and have a rep so like you don't have to be signed to a publisher or a label to have a sync rep 
Um, or you can go the route of signing with a publisher, but your masters are your stone and control in that um, you're, you're not signed to a label or you create your own label. Um, and something that like, I kind of want to stress while we're on this topic is like, I, I get that what happens in every musician's mind and it happened in mine back in the day when I was a musician in, in the same, in your same shoes. Um, I get that everyone has this idea that it's like, I got to go to the supervisor, 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 supervisor is the person that's going to unlock this world for me. And they're going to get my music synced. And yes, that does happen. But these third party licensing companies, these sync companies, um, publishers, it's literally our job to find you and to rep your music. And that's, it's our job to have healthy relationships with all the supervisors and the networks and the executives, um, while also anring artists and finding the right artists for our rosters. So yes, you can be independent. I'm an advocate for building a team. Like these artists I, who think they have to do everything for themselves and stretch themselves really thin while also working three jobs. Like that's not the way to further the career. It's to build a solid team. And working with a company that's going to rep your music that has those relationships is an extension of your team, just like a label would be, or again, if you want to go the route of a publisher. Um, so I just want to throw that in there and be like, we're, like people in my position are looking for you guys, just so you know. Um, and uh, like we are, we're the people to definitely reach out to. Some companies don't accept submissions. Some do, like Eric was saying so wisely earlier, like you really have to like, it's not a straight path. You kind of have to like, research your companies and, and figure out, you know, how to get in with each one or how to build that relationship. Um, but that's a really long winded way of saying, yes, you can be independent and kill it and still build a team and get repped and get syncs. I'm that, out. That was not, <laughs> I love you, Jaden. That was not long winded at all. And I think that was really genius. And I think, you know, even for us who do it all the time, like I use people like Jaden and Amy too, you know, uh, major publishers are not the bad guys either. You know, there are people within, and Amy and I have talked about this, there are people within those publishing companies, especially now, who want to evolve and not be like their predecessors. And you can make amazing deals with publishers and work with them. And Amy brings me artists that are signed all the time that we work with as independent. We're independent. We're not signed to Sony. And sometimes we just let them represent certain songs or just do certain deals for us. Whenever you can have a professional like an Amy or Jaden, I live for having Jaden pitch anything she wants to for us. It also keeps my relationships clean. I, you know, look, I have some of these supervisors are my really close friends. I don't want to ask them for shit. <laughs> Pardon my French, but it helps to have yes. that scary. You know, it really does. And to have the intermediary also means, or right, get ready for Jennifer, your business will be buttoned up and those supervisors and those content creators know that if it's coming from Amy or coming from Jaden, they don't have to stress out if there are any legal issues with any of your clearances or anything that's going to come to likely not bite them in the ass. So true. Love that. Very nice. Hey, uh, we got Veronica next. Hello. Hello. Thank you guys for having me and putting this together as always. Um, I was going to ask, I'm, I'm trying to contact um, and get heard in a, a few different areas because, you know, that's how you are when you're starting out. Um, when contacting a music supervisor, at what point in the production of a film are they looking for music? And at what point is it too late and you shouldn't bother them? Jennifer, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, it just depends on the project. Some projects in development, you know, if we're writing original songs or if we're trying to write songs in the script, we are talking about music. And it just honestly depends on the project. You know, films that are in production, it, it honestly just depends. I know that's not really the answer you're wanting. I think it's just having you having to do the homework about learning how content is made. There are tons and tons and tons of resources online that tell you this is what post-production means. This is what pre-production means. This is what production means. So it's just you doing the research and then you can kind of follow them. I mean, Deadline and Variety, they, they do announcements all the time. 
you know, right now, I mean, everyone's projects are in the news probably every other day. So if someone emails me and is like, hey, how's this project going? I'm like, dude, I've been shut down for COVID for like a week. Why are you emailing me about this now? Like, just do your homework, you know, type of thing. All that education is out there. So just like look it up and then just look at Deadline, The Wrap and Variety. They announce things like every 10 minutes about things. And you can kind of tell if something is just casted, no, they're not looking for music. If things in the middle of shooting, maybe. If it's a TV show and it's shooting, maybe. It just, you know, if it's a documentary, maybe. So just kind of go online, read the trades and just kind of follow it. Yeah, I would say for documentaries, it, it can happen a little faster because they're going less for needle drops in, um, you know, from major publishers and things like that. So it's nice for them to have independent buckets of music is a lot what we like to put together for those sometimes. And even in our radio edits, um, we will, which are, we don't have a movie yet. We have an idea for a movie and we're just, that means we're just stringing together picture, you know, to say, does the, do these scenes kind of work together? Um We'll pull from independent buckets of music, especially, and that's something, again, we should talk about in another room, but edit, it's not always music supervisors who are putting music in for all of um, film and TV and also trailers and nothing else. It's editors. editors yeah, it's key. editors. Are, yeah, editor, editors are key. Um, you know, just, just do the research. Um, guys, I have to jump off. It was wonderful to be here. Sorry, uh, Katie, Katie. Um, for missing your question. Thank you, Eric, Steph, Jaden, Jess, Amy, everyone else. Um, I will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so There's some music Jennifer. coming with Jennifer. Thank you. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Bye, everyone. <laughs> bye, bye, Jennifer. Bye. Oh, see, it's funny that Jen, like Jennifer mentioned that because I wasn't sure. I was like, oh, do, do they want that said? Like the editor thing is a it's its own room pro tip kind of a thing. Don't abuse that either. I'm going to throw that out there. Very yes, clearly. don't abuse it, but we're all but, about spilling the secrets in this room, right? <laughs> Come on. But we I know like, way too do. many projects where the editor has pulled in, you know, an artist's different song multiple times and keeps going back to someone because they're like, I can clear your stuff and I know it's already been used. So you're in our system. Totally different combo at this point. But um, yeah, anyhow. I do want to say, as as somebody who who was an editor, um, it is like a legal nightmare when editors drop songs into cuts because then I have to deal with the temp love. So I'm just going to say that as you and approach editors, um, they they're they're doing it purely creatively without all the the next following steps thinking about it. So that is, I love music editors. Um, it has a special place in my heart, but that's the one thing, the one catch is that they're going to full creative and then we have to like kind of walk it back a little bit and make, make some of the directors mad <laughs> because I'm like, actually, we can't get that song. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's a huge thing. replacement issue too. I mean, that comes up almost, uh, no, that comes up literally every week. This is not a small, like we should, we'll get into this in our kind of like business of mu music thing, um, you know, demo love and what that means. As oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody yeah. who's on this stage has dealt I'll with say that. One, can I say one last thing based off that yeah. last question, though, is that also, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're starting out smaller, obviously it can be a little rough to, to hail Mary like the next... I don't know, a uh, big Disney animation film or something and be like, use my tune, you know, but um, whatever your style of, of a song that you're pitching for, I mean, just like I would be like, Hey, study, study the music and, and pitch accordingly. I mean, um, there's a lot of fantastic young and upcoming directors doing film festivals, doing, you know, the, the college circuits know which like, like I went to USC, you know, the, a lot of the kids there that are in the master's programs are doing giant things now. And I guarantee you some of the people who tapped in early on the composers or songwriters who have worked with, and if you've built that relationship, right, they will, you know, like remember that you helped them out when they needed it, uh, like at some point. And, you know, you, you can grow together. That's, that's not a bad thing. Matthew Head was on the program last week. He's an Emmy Award winning composer. Worked on Greenleaf. He's yep. doing the people like doing all this music. He just did like a free project for like a UCLA grad student because he's like, this kid is amazing and he's going to be like the next Tarantino or something. And so it's, you know, if, if somebody like him can reach, reach out, reach out 
at that level, then we all, we all can do that. Yeah, and that's what I mean, too. Don't always aim for the big movie. I mean, I had a meeting with Disney once, like it was a lunch thing, and they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. This was right when Disney streaming was happening. And I said, I don't know. You're doing Disney streaming. Aren't you going to be doing like a thousand little things, like maybe a show that you have a hard time on or something like that because I like solving problems? And she looked at me and said, man, I am, can I just thank you? And I said, for what? And she goes, for not asking me to work on Aladdin. She was like, you know, because people come in on their first shot with us and go, oh, can I have this project? And it's like, maybe you're amazing, but we don't know you yet. They need time to validate you too. So what is saying is try to start small. I love independent film product pro projects, student projects, talk to editors, people, people who are not music supervisors, just content creators, TikTokers, Anybody who makes content are great resources for you to, you know, start placing your music. So don't think you have to be bound. And I love music supervising, especially hours on this stage. But don't feel like you are bound to only being able to put your music forth through a supervisor for a specific thing. Try contacting other contact, you know, uh, content creators at all different levels. Anyone who's an aspiring music supervisor as well, this is, you could put this um, advice towards that. Uh, I got my start in college uh, just uh, working with my friends who were studying production with me, um, doing the gig in school. Um, and I did a lot of just student films to like get my feet in the door to just go through the motions of supervising. Obviously, very low scale, not no budget, you know, but it's really good to learn and learn how to make the music and the minimal budget, if you even have one, work with you. Um, so. Great, great advice for aspiring soups too. Awesome, awesome. All right, Katie, you get the last question of the night. Thanks, I appreciate it. I've met a few of you through either Sync Keepers or the Guild of Music Supervisors. I've actually made great connections through the Guild of Music Supervisors and have songs now with half a dozen sync agencies, which is awesome. But I'm also pitching myself. And the question I had was if I'm sending a playlist, like a disco playlist, is it helpful, uh, and it would have been good to get an answer from Jennifer on this, is it helpful if I include the split sheet uh, that has um, like one-stop clearance as part of our split agreement um, that I'm authorized to clear the song for everyone? So is it helpful to have that in my disco playlist so that you have, so that you know I have all my ducks in, in a row up front? No, if you're one stop, you're one stop. And if we're working with you and you're, we're at the place where I need to know that information, I would only need your split sheet info for cue sheets. And I would ask for more than just name, songwriter names. I need all the publishing to your own percentage breakdown. Um, but if you're one stop, I would just assume you're one stop. I don't need to know everyone else's business. I just need to clear it to you. Okay. And then the, if I the tell you I'm one stop, later. you're going to believe me. Yeah, and then if the problem happens, that's uh, the red flag that will um, will de have a detrimental. Not, is that like a dramatic word to you? It no. will have a negative impact on our relationship, and I probably wouldn't work with 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 anyone again if they right. lied about their business being tied up. Because typically, that would mean if I'm finding it out, um, a legal issue popped up and some kind of claim happened. Um, so yeah, so definitely like don't say you're one stop if you're not uh, because we I have had that happen where I got pitched a song trying to clear it last minute. Um, oh, actually, I don't have this. I have to like so and so actually reps its master. Um, and if we're moving too fast, I could lose you the gig because we'll have to move on to a song that I can clear. Um, so it is very important to if it is one stop, have it actually be one stop. And don't say you're, and this is not for you, Katie, but for the room, don't say you're one stop if you're not sure what one stop means. You know, we talk about it in here, um, but things like one, you hear a lot of the phrases one stop and easy to clear. Katie, my disco um, playlist, I, I simply state in the comments that my music is one stop and easy to clear. I do in my disco in the metadata, I do list all my writers just because it's easy to do in disco, and so that's in there, um, as well as with, right, along we with the percentage there, splits. But uh, not required, and I definitely don't load the um, the sheets. But yeah, so um, just for the room, we're saying all these phrases and the terms. Take the time to um, learn the terms, but um, don't uh, don't don't say, "Oh, this is the key. This is the gem. If I just start doing this, then that'll unlock the door." Make sure you, you really 
um, understand what all that means behind it. And so with that, let's, um, we're going to transition. I'm going to do a, just a, a, a wrap. Steph and I will do a wrap up and, uh, wait, somebody's on the stage. I just brought Morgan up to introduce him because he hasn't really been on Clubhouse yet. This is one of my songwriting partners. He signed over at Sony ATV where Amy is. And I wanted to just quick get him in the room for you guys because he, uh, Morgan is of, um, he was in a, in a great band called Boys Like Girls. They had a couple smash hits in his time, uh, but he's an incredible sync writer now and an incredible talent. So I just wanted to throw him up here and put him on the spot. Thank you Morgan. very much. Hi, Jess. Hi, uh, hi, Steph. Yes, this is my first time speaking on the thing, but um, music industry is an absolute crazy thing to be involved in. And it, and luckily it worked out. Whatever Steph has said in this room is great advice. You should follow it. It's hard to find good advice in the industry, it's different than the movie industry. I'm not sure that people in the music industry help each other as much as they do in the film industry. Um, but that being said, I'm here to answer a question or two if anybody has it. I was really glad to have you here, Mar. I'm glad Steph pulled you up. It was really awesome. We're actually just wrapping up this particular room, but we're going to transition into um, our after party room, which is really like just kind of like a no holds barred um people whoever comes up on stage we chat we get it's get to know each other but we do this room every wednesday so i really hope you kind of come back because we do like q a every wednesday around this time between between 8 p.m and uh 10 p.m so well eric i'm honored for the invite if steph is going to the after party then i'm going of course <laughs> Of course we're going. Everyone in this room is going to jump over to the after party. And, you know, look, I wanted to introduce you, guys, introduce you to Eric. I'm um, sorry, introduce you to Morgan, because I keep going on about collaboration. You know, again, one more kind of hack into getting into these other relationships, as Amy and I were talking earlier, is to build relationships with other amazing creators, because not only does it teach you how to be a better songwriter. It's super fun and you make good friends and then you get their teams attached to them. So with that said, let's all get to know each other better in the after party. Uh, come on, Gil. Uh, war, war, Gildy. War. Yeah, let's eat it. Yeah. Yeah, he beat me. He beat me. <laughs> Totally beat me for sound, it. This is the only reason we keep Koichi and GoFloor around are for sound effects. I just want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so dope anyway listen everyone um this has been control camp we are if you just happen to roll through the room we're a community of uh sync licensing folk all kind of leveling up and learning and kind of growing together we have been talking for the last couple of hours just about sync 101 we've talked about oh uh, seven steps for engaging with music supervisors we talked about the four steps for getting your music placed if you've missed that, no worries. One, we are recording these rooms. And so if you go to our website, controlcamp.com, you can find one, you can get access to all of the previous rooms that we had. We, we, all of our Patreon subscribers can get access to previous room and anyone can get access to these cool little short eBooks that we do that uh, wraps up a lot of the information that we discuss in here. We Q and a, a lot of people, we get a lot of info. We put these into these eBooks and we make it available to the community. So controlcamp.com is where you go to learn all about that. We're back. If we're back here this Saturday for a listening session, again, on our website, there's a submit page. You can submit a song and then Saturday we'll review some of these songs and talk about how they work and sync licensing. Some of the people on the stage will be there. So you get some industry feedback, um, as, as well. So that's on Saturday. There is a new option on the website. Uh, we're coming to the, we've got one more week left in Black History Month, and we're going into Women's History Month. And we've got a whole bunch of cool programs we're going to do um, for Women's History Month. Steph is heading up a number of those. One of the things we're going to do is um, we are going to take one Wednesday and just spotlight the women producers and women composers in our community. We've got some amazing talents that we found in the listening sessions. And so instead of where Wednesdays where we normally just focus on the superstars and the big composers and the supervisors, we want to highlight the dope talent that's in our community. So if you're a producer, 
um, and you got uh, at least three songs that you've produced, go to our website under submit so, and select the, when you do the submission, same submission you would do for Saturdays, but instead in the drop down, what you're submitting for, select the women's, I think it says like women's producers spotlight, select that and then put a playlist of like three songs that you created and we'll so, uh, select some of those to just give you your flowers on a, on a main night here and really, really highlight you and let the world know that you exist. Um, so right now, if you are a control camp member, come, we're going to, when this room closes up, give me like one minute and 22 seconds and then the new room will open up. That says after party, you have to be a fo you have to be following control camp to even see the room. So if you're not following control camp, uh, you click on my picture at the very bottom. It says control camp as the as the first club and just follow it. And then, uh, and then you're in. That's the only membership. No other hazing, nothing else. Uh, you just in that easily because we have no no bar. Um, Steph, thanks so much for co-hosting with me and filling in and covering for for Daraj. I miss Daraj so much. I'm sorry I'm not as spunky as him and as not as positive because I love him, but uh, we we miss oh, him. Oh, you're good. You are good, Steph. <laughs> Great. Oh, thanks, Gildy and Amy, Jaden, Gildy, Koichi, Jess, and now newly minted Morgan. Welcome to your you know clubhouse initiation. Welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you guys for being on the stage tonight and giving such amazing information. And we'll see you on the after party. Appreciate all of you all. Thank you so much. Uh, yep. All right. So close down, look up in about 72 seconds and you'll see the after party showing up and uh, come on in there. It's uh, no, it's not a moderation. We don't, um, and we don't pull anybody up. If anybody can come on stage. Just raise a hand as soon as you get in there and we'll come up and we'll just chat. We get to know each other. See you over there. <laughs>